This video is brought to you by patreon.com slash worst take. Get access to exclusive live streams and Discord servers, on-screen shout outs, and early access to some videos when you join now. Help make sure that we can continue to make content like this by supporting the Patreon. Links are in the description down below. You know, something rare happened, and that rare thing happened where we got to hear a conversation between the team's head coach and the team's starting quarterback. And this is a rare opportunity for us fans, for people who watch the team, cover the team, who care about the Cleveland Browns, because you don't often get to see, um, you know, a head coach and a quarterback kind of like discuss each other's roles and, and what they do um, in this way. So I thought it was a great opportunity to kind of get more insight on the team. And I also think that this interview has a lot of great information in it. One of the first thing that was brought up, right? Because how Kevin carries himself leads a lot of people to make assumptions about how people feel about him. Like, I think people see that Kevin doesn't scream on the sidelines, that Kevin's not the most celebratory guy, and they kind of create a whole personality around him that might not even be close to who Kevin Stefanski is to people who actually know him. Um, and I think those misconceptions kind of create a lot of the perception of who Kevin Stefanski is and how his players receive him. But just listen to how Deshaun Watson talks about Kevin um, and, and the guys, how the guys feel about Kevin. Yeah, there's another trophy I'd like uh, <laughs> Most definitely. much, much more than, than that one. Uh, you know what's great about that thing is it's a representation of your team. Uh, you don't win that thing if you don't have the players. You don't win that thing if you don't have the coaching staff that are helping you. So I, I look at that as a collective award. Uh, and, and that's so I'm. It's, I don't love th talking about it, quite honestly, but I do love that it represents our operation, represents our players, represents our coaches. And I say this, I'm gonna give you your flowers, live coach. Uh -oh. The things that, that you do for the organization, for this community, but for the locker room. The guys talk about it every day, talk about it all the time. I think that is a, a, a big testimony to what you and AB is doing for this organization, for this community, and it's something special. And we talk about it in the locker room, and I think that's why you know we go out there every Sunday or whenever we're playing, and we give you 110% because you treat us like men, you give us our flowers when we need to, but also you push us hard enough to go out there on the practice field and compete. And then once we get out there on Sundays, it make it a lot easier. Well, I appreciate that. And as you yeah, it's real easy to get caught up in small bits of info and try to create your own story around it in the absence of the bigger info that you don't have. But it's always important to keep perspective that what you might assume probably has a good chance of not being correct. Um, and you got to actually listen to what guys are saying, listen to how guys are reacting, listen to what guys actually say about Kevin Stefanski to get a better picture of it. Um, another thing that I thought was interesting, is something we talk about on this channel a ton, um, because I'm not one who gets super upset with a specific play call in a game or hyper focuses on a play call during a Browns game, because to me, the play call is just a part of the process. Like I would have an issue if the strategy for a game, if the play sheet for a game seemed like it just wasn't hitting on all cylinders or wasn't even close to what was necessary in order to win that game. I like to focus on the process. I think sometimes people who focus on just the play call and complain about a specific play call, what they're really complaining about is the result. But complaining about the result is a hindsight argument. You're always going to be correct after the fact about something you complain about after the fact because it already happened. But I don't like to engage in that because I just don't think it's productive and it doesn't give you a good read on where the team actually is. The things that I've 
learned over the years that helped me get a better read of where the team is to talk to you guys about it is more of the process stuff, right? Okay, what's going into why these decisions are made? Why did they feel like that play call would work there? What did they see? Kevin talks about this um, in this clip. Form and a science. And, and when I say that, I mean, in game, you're there, you know, they talk about the feel of the game and, and right. understanding, all right, we got to get to this play. That, that corner just went out of the game. We got to attack that other corner. There's also the science behind it. And to me, I mean, the process. Mm -hmm. The stuff that we do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is as important as the order of which the play comes off the call sheet on Sunday. So when we're in that meeting room and, and all the coaches and we're together, we're like, we love this this play action. Uh, we feel like we're going to get man coverage. We're going to get Elijah to sell the far cross. He's going to come out of it. Here's why we like it, because here's what they've shown on tape. Those are the conversations and, and the play design. That's all happening during the week. Now, when it comes off the play sheet, that really is, is more to the art form of it, if you will. Yeah, I bet, because it's art form, like just relaying the play. You had to do it to, what, four different quarterbacks last yeah. year, right? Those guys are getting a bunch of information after relay it to 10 other guys to make sure – that they can execute a play successfully. Yeah, that, it's so interesting. You know, that, that play goes from that call sheet. All I have to do is read. That's the easy part. I just put my <laughs> finger down and I start reading. The hard part is getting it to the quarterback. Okay, now it's going in, in. He's covering his ears so he can hear it. And then he's selling it in that huddle to his teammates. And, and you know, he's telling F, what, you know, X, and, and being descriptive, selling it to those guys like, hey, this, this play is going to work. And then, oh, by the way, you got to go execute. Yeah. <laughs> like, I get the easy part. I'll One thing we tend to fall into as fans, as people who cover the game, as media members, all of the above, is we fall into thinking or assuming that every player is doing exactly what was written up at the time when we want to be critical of a play call, right? We're like, oh, why would you call this where the where Wyatt Teller does that and then, then he runs this route? Why would you call this at this point in the game? Sometimes it's not like that. Football is a game of variables. It's probably the game with the most variables. You have 11 people on the field on each side. You have one football that's oblong shaped that has many different wind variables um, that affect the physics of the ball. You have so many different plays that can be called, so many different penalties that can be called. Like on one play, more things can happen in a football game than in almost any other sport in the world. So there's a ton of variables and you can't just assume that everything went the way it's supposed to, or that just because it didn't go the way that it was supposed to, that the, the core uh, thought around that play is bad. So, you know, he brings it up. We can look at this play and be critical of it. Why isn't Wyatt following David like he's supposed to? Why did Kevin call this look into pressure? Why did Watson underthrow that ball? It seems super simple and super gratifying to do that in the moment where we can sit there with all of the benefit of hindsight and feel superior to the people who are calling the plays or running the plays or, or a part of the team. And we can feel like we are the smartest person in the room. But it's probably and it's almost always never that simple. Like when we have these simple solutions for problems that have existed, it's clearly not simple. If it was that simple, it would have been done. J, J, or J formations are what we call one by three. So you see the tight ends up top, so he's the one, and the three receivers down to the side. And what you're trying to do, and Deshaun knows this, what we're trying to do is make the play look like something and then it's not. Yep. Mm -hmm. And with, with Nick Chubb back there, we're under center in this formation. We're trying to make this look like wide zone football. So those initial steps for the defense should look like that. Mm -hmm. And then this is a max protection, so we're keeping Dave in up top and he's pass blocking. What's so interesting about this play is this protection is not we don't want to test this protection meaning yeah. this protection is not going to block up every type of pressure and and guess what here's Deshaun under center and they're bringing a pressure into it so, that, yeah. so first things first he should look <laughs> over the sideline and be like hey dude don't call that in that pressure <laughs> but what do you do is you call play you call plays thinking about players okay and what happens on this play is our players make this work and you'll see our uh, guard here in, in this case I think it's Wyatt he pops out originally thinking he's going to go help Dave Njoku. Instead, he feels that pressure come and he's able to 
come back. So now Deshaun has to navigate a loud pocket. Uh, we always talk about, hey, it'd be great to have a clean pocket every t- single time. That doesn't <laughs> happen. So here's Deshaun yep. navigating a clean pocket, able to step up in that pocket and then deliver a ball to Elijah on really what amounts to a double move. No, yeah, definitely. And I think I saw so I saw the pressure. And usually on play action, we take about, what, eight to nine steps. Yep. I kind of quickened my, my steps up a little bit, stepped up in the pocket. And that, I think this game was the first game where it was super rainy. So for me, you see Elijah wide open. I don't want to overthrow him. Right. You're not going to miss a, a, you know, a wide open guy like that. So I gave him a catchable ball, and you know, the rest is, is up to him. That game, if you remember, it was a rain. You know there's snow globes? That yep. was a rain globe. For like sure. The, it was the craziest. <laughs> I remember going back into the – after pregame warm-up, going back into my office and grabbing my phone and looking at the radar. There was no rain. None. There's no rain <laughs> except you walk out and it's 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 raining you just somehow. Miss. Everything is uh, coming down. You know, that, that's, that's the weather down on the lake. But just like you said, that, that ball was slippery. It was crazy throughout that entire game. Both teams uh, had issues with that football. But Definitely. sometimes you get those guys open and you're like, dude, we're just, we know we're going to get 30-plus yards. Let's not overthrow them. Let's not underthrow them. Most definitely. So I, I, I want to have a question, really. So why it's not following David? Why is that happening? Well, he's trying to keep the play alive. And he feels like if he follows David, he's going to let a free run through or pressure through that's going to kill this play dead before it even has a chance. So, yeah, he's going to hurt the play a little bit by not doing what he's supposed to do. But he's going to keep the play's ability to stay alive, alive. Um, why did Kevin call this into pressure, right? You can complain about that but Cincinnati just ran a pressure out of a look that they never showed pressure out of I mean just a huge variable why did Deshaun Watson under throw that ball well the weather was awful one and two it was a very low scoring game in a situation like that you want to prioritize a completion over trying to score on that play the 40 yards are much more worth it than the chance of you throwing a touchdown because if that play doesn't get completed, there are so few opportunities for chunk plays when you have weather like that that you can't waste them. Like You have to just throw the safest ball possible in that situation. It's actually a good thing that Deshaun Watson underthrew that ball because if he overthrew it, that might have cost you the game. Remember, The Bengals had like 100 yards of offense in this game. There was not that many opportunities for big plays in this game. So when you have one, you just got to make sure you can do what you have to do to get one completed so you can get the yardage because yards in a a slow scoring game are at a premium. It all makes sense when you think about it. But at first glance, you can have all of these quick little criticisms that Don't really hold up to further scrutiny. And I think that's important for me to think about whenever I talk about this team. It's important for a lot of people who cover the team to think about because for me in this chair, it's easy to watch something go wrong in a game and say that shouldn't have happened. Why did that happen? Somebody should be fired because that happened. What's difficult is figuring out what happened. Why did that happen? Well, whose fault could that be that that happened? And is that such? It is it such an egregious mistake that I feel like something needs to be done, or did shit just happen? And like ninety percent of the time, especially when you're a team as good as the Browns, the stuff that goes wrong is usually shit just happened. Like you just you can't control everything. Everything's not going to go your way. It happened. You got the wrong play call at the wrong time. They had the right play call at the right time is what it is. One of the more interesting things that Deshaun Watson and Kevin Stefanski also talked about was how adjustments work in game. It's something we talk about on this channel where, you know, we are kind of bred and conditioned to think about football adjustments as halftime adjustments, because that's when we get the time to talk about them. Like at mass, right? We have to have a halftime show. There needs to be stuff to talk about during a halftime show. And one of the things that always works in a halftime show format is one of the analysts going on there and saying, hey, this is what this team needs to do in the second half. These are the adjustments that they need to make. And then we can see if that team made those adjustments. And since we process it from a viewer standpoint, we look at it as, okay, you did this in the first half. You go in the second half. You get the coaching points. 
and then you make the adjustments after that. But in the reality of the NFL and the reality of just any football game as far as high school to college, any kind of serious football, the adjustments are happening constantly. If you've never been to at least a division one, it doesn't even have to be one a, it could be FCS or FBS. But if you just go to a college football game, right. And have the opportunity to sit near a sideline. I think this would be something that would really enhance people's understanding of like what actually goes down the football game. So if you ever have the chance, it could be a small college, it could be a big college and you have the chance to sit next to the sideline. I want you to do that so you can see that pretty much every time a unit comes off the field, they're breaking into different position groups and those position groups are being coached up, right? Like not just like, hey, I'm yelling at you need to play better. Like, no, no, no. They got tape out. They got boards out. They are coaching, right? They are basically doing the same thing they would do in the locker room during halftime. And again, college is different, right? Because you do get more time for halftime, but still the same thing happens throughout the course of the game. You're not going to wait till halftime to make an adjustment. If a team knows how to play against your, your, your a four man front or whatever you are running, then you got to adjust, right? If they know that you're going to do something and they're going to counter off of that, you have to adjust that next drive. So that's something I always suggest to people, but here's the clip. Halftime. Mm. So you come in, you play your first half, you come in, you probably have, they say 10 minutes, it's probably five minutes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like what is your process going through at halftime to try to make adjustments to get ready for the second half? Yeah, it's insane. Uh, honestly, I'll, I'll never forget my first halftime of my first preseason game as, as a young coach with the Vikings it was like all right I, you know, I thought it was college where the band's playing on the field and you got all this time and I'm gonna go, it was like uh, two minutes you got the, yep. the referees are banging on the door you guys got to come out I'm like, are you kidding me so to Deshaun's point like that halftime if you're waiting till halftime to make an adjustment <laughs> yeah. you're you're in trouble so those those adjustments are happening really in a series in between the series halftime what we try to do is have a lot of conversation on the headset the last call it five minutes preparing ourselves for that halftime right. so we're talking okay hey, what are the first three passes what are the first three runs we want to get to what's the pressure that they brought in this in this first half that they're probably going to bring again so we can coach the guys up on how we're going to pick it up so once we get in there we huddle up super fast hit those things, and then we're in front of the players right away. And we, we bring in a, a whiteboard. We, we put up uh, the plays. We project the plays on the board like, hey, here's what, here's what you can expect of the next plays to happen. But I guess my big point is those adjustments better be happening throughout the game. They're happening – Sometimes in the series, like, hey, Deshaun, uh, you know, you're telling Deshaun, hey, tell the left tackle to be ready for it. And, <laughs> yep. you know, hey, they just brought that pressure. They're probably going to bring it again. Remember, he's got to go all the way out to the nickel. Like, Definitely. those are the type of things that are happening both in series, in between series, in between the quarters, and, and obviously at halftime as well. For sure. Well, no, Coach, we appreciate you. Hold on, before we get off, though. Okay, okay yeah, yeah. This coach. Is, is, now we can start <laughs> yeah, going. I can, I can. Again, it's always interesting to get these moments where you get to hear – um, your quarterback and your head coach kind of talk about how they feel about football. Um, it's nice to be a fly in the wall in that situation. I thought this was great stuff for a Browns fan to have. Um, but thank you guys for watching. Y'all have a great day. Have even better night. Peace. Peace.